What's going on, guys? It's Bromley at Empire Barbell. Pumpkin Jack's been doing a good job keeping the eye on the gym around the Halloween time, making sure all the knuckleheads stay in line when I'm not here. A lot of people have been leaving their shit out, and uh, every time you know, somebody does something egregious, like pulling one of the kegs out or leaving a log up in the rack, or just pain in the ass for everyone else, this is my snitch. This is the guy that rats everybody out. But today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about posture and positioning and bracing. This is something I've talked a lot about before, but as we get new, uh, I've been getting a good amount of subscribers on a regular basis. I don't like to recycle new material too much, but things that are definitely worth harping on that are worth driving home, I am going to repeat myself over and over because it's, it's important that not all the stuff I put out is just to try and, and get a search ranking or just to try and fill up content. If I'm gonna take the time to put something out, it's gotta be worthwhile. So posturing and embracing is probably one of the most important foundational elements about lifting that does not get harped on enough. So I've been planning, or I've been you know, working a cycle building up to a big deadlift. And actually I'm gonna show you guys later what my progression has looked like and how well it's played out for me. Because it's gonna be something I take and apply in the future when I have you know, big deadlift shows coming up. But the deadlift specifically for me is something I've always struggled with. Now, I always credit it to my, uh, you know, disadvantaged physique, I guess. My leverages aren't, aren't optimal. I got short legs, short arms, and a long torso. So I might be four inches shorter than somebody, but if we're sitting in a booth at Denny's, we're the same height. So I carry all my, all my height right here. Now it makes squatting and pressing very easy. And it's also one of the reasons why I was a good overhead presser very soon, but it did make deadlifts a little more awkward. That's kind of a cop out because no matter how bad your leverages are, you can work around it. I mean, some of the best pressers have had long wingspans. People think tall guys are disadvantaged, but you know, all the thousand pound deadlifters are you know, six, six, six foot eight, something like that. Uh, and I'll even use myself as an example because my deadlift has improved dramatically recently. So it's really important that you be aware of your leverages when you're making training decisions, but you don't want to use them as a crutch for, well, I'm not good at this because I'm not built for it. Because that's not why we're here. We're here to chip away, take into account the things we can accept the things we can't and do the best we can to improve steadily over time. And you always have options. There's always something you can do. So the real reason my deadlift was horrendous is because it was my favorite lift when I was a teenager. And I would just, with no guidance, go full bore, pull as hard and as often as I could, sometimes multiple times a week. And you guessed it, I got injured. So my first injury came about the time I was 16. I've had maybe nine or 10 in the 10 years after that. And I'm talking about incidents, not like, oh, I tweak something or I'm sore. I mean, things that put me out from any lifting for at least six weeks. Uh, there were injuries I had where my back got so bad, I just, I thought I wasn't gonna be able to lift again. I'm like, at this point, my discs just must be degenerated. I must have scar tissue. I must have tendons and ligaments that are just hanging and frayed off the bone. Uh, it, it was a real hard thing to try and wrap my head around how I was going to become a better puller. And uh, for that reason, my press went up, my squat went up. I mean, I, I put, realistically, I put about 100 pounds on my squat in that time because squatting was fine on my back and I could squat with reckless abandon and maybe put 20 or 30 pounds. I'm talking about an eight or 10 year period, uh, 20 or 30 pounds on my deadlift. I mean, I never really got it over the mid sixes and anything over 550, you're talking about anything over 85%, I would just hesitate, I'd feel bad, I'd feel brittle, I'd feel weak. So. It was, a big, uh, it was a big psychological battle to try and get over that hurdle and try and feel good. So I had to really analyze, okay, why am I struggling? What are these injuries from? And how am I gonna fix it? So all of my injuries specifically, you're talking about the lower back, it was from posture. So, cause I have a long back, you'll notice the amount of meat I have in the middle of my back. When I would pull, I would round and all that tension would end up right here. And as I would, I would straighten out as I stood up. And that's, that's not something you wanna get in the habit of doing. I mean. In general, yeah, there's a lot of lifters that pull with a rounded back, but you want a neutral spine. I did not have a neutral spine. I would just hang on my erectors. So especially you get that first injury, if you keep compounding into that, it's gonna get worse every time. It's gonna happen more frequently. That's exactly what happened. So for me, I had to figure out, okay, how do I keep a neutral spine? How do I keep my lumbar spine neutral? Not necessarily arch, but certainly not rounded forward uh, in that position. And for me, it came down to, I was horrendously tight, glutes and hamstrings. So getting into a bottom position was super difficult because I just never stretched. Um, and my abdominals weren't strong enough. That was the big one. When I did deadlift, I had to have a belt and I had to have it tight, but even then it wasn't enough. So when I finally diagnosed that part of my back rehab, this didn't even start till a couple years ago. I mean, my first injury, I was 16. You're talking mid, late 20s is when I 
finally started paying attention to this and uh, I couldn't do anything beltless. I mean, the idea of squatting 315 beltless was a no-go. The idea of deadlifting 225 beltless, I mean, that's how bad it was. So I had to get in a position where I got my abdominals strong enough that they could clamp down, do their job, brace, you know, that circumferential support that they talk about. Your, your abdominals brace you in 360 degrees. The guy wire uh, analogy, you think of cables, tension cables pulling in opposite directions. My erectors and my abdominals, my obliques off the side, and then this is the antenna, and that's how you get stabilized, is that opposing force. So if one side's weak, the other side's gonna become overactive, but you're gonna be out of position, you're gonna put wear uh, disproportionately on one structure over the other, you get injured. So I had to really learn, and for me it was my, it wasn't my, I always thought, oh, my back's weak, my back's weak, my back wasn't weak, my abdominals were weak. So that, in addition to the anterior pelvic tilt I got, I had a video, you know, if you wanna go check it out, I have two videos about the anterior pelvic tilt that goes more in detail. But basically, you arch, and this is the athletic posture you see a lot. But what happens, your, your hips tilt back, so that lengthens your glutes and hamstrings, and it lengthens your abdominals. So you got not just in your main movers that you know, move your hip, but also your stabilizers are stretched open, and that's a weak position for muscles. So I had to figure out how to fix that tilt. So because I spent so many years trying to keep my back what I thought was straight, I would arch as I deadlifted, I would arch extra hard, and I always felt weak. And of course that makes sense. If you're lengthened out, if all those muscles are in a really long disadvantaged position, you're never gonna get the type of power you need to break that bar from a dead stop. So the second I got comfortable tilting my hips under and tightening my abs by bringing my ribs down, glutes and hamstrings are short, abdominals are short. Now in this position, and it was weird at first, I'm not gonna lie, it was weird trying to get down to the bar, I would shake trying to keep position because the coordination wasn't there. But once I got into a tight position, as I got to the bottom, I felt so tight and so bound up that I could just blow through the ground. So I already established, okay, my legs are in a stronger position, I can push through the ground. This took a lot longer because it was not intuitive, it was not a pattern I had ingrained over 20 years, 15 years of lifting. So I had to start that from scratch. I'm still getting better at it, but I would say this year, you're talking about realistically like three, four years of paying attention to it, probably not doing it as often as I should have, but of at least being aware of paying attention to it. And it's just firing now where I can maintain a strong rigid midsection. I don't feel that inclination under weight to cave, to uh, let that tension go to my lower back. I can start strong and because of that, I can hand he handle heavier weights, but I can pull faster off the ground. Before, I had to Think of it this way, your grip's about to give, what happens if you're carrying something in your hands, your hands are strong, you can just run, you can go full steam. If your grip is giving, you slow down your steps, right? Because you're just hanging on by a thread. It's the same thing with your back. If your back is about to give, you're not gonna be able to put a ton of horsepower into that extension because that will just accelerate the rate at which your back gives, it'll just give faster. So. I ended up putting the brakes on because that's the only way I could keep something that looked like a stable spine. Well, now that I'm braced, holy shit, I could just pull into that bar and I get more bar speed, I have more momentum at my former stick points, my lockout's better, I can do more reps. So just recently, I saw this massive surge in, uh, in, my, de in my deadlifting ability. So to kind of chart it over the last couple months, anytime I get over 600 pounds, even if I felt good, I might be a little achy because my back wasn't used to supporting that weight with that that hip position tucked under. Every week that's gone by, because I followed about a four week wave where I work up to something heavy-ish and back off and spend four weeks working back up. As I get to that last week, if I push it, I've always been a little achy. Well, last week I just handled my weight for triples that was part of my last wave that left me achy for like three days. And last week I handled that weight and I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel tension in my back while I was pulling. I didn't feel tension in my back the days after, there was no achiness, no brittleness. So it's not just that I'm more efficient, I'm able to move more weight, I'm healthier. My deadlift objectively is stronger than it's ever been, and I feel better. And for a long time, I was just having to accept it. Well, as long as I wanna keep getting stronger, my body's just gonna fall apart. And that is not the way it needs to be. In fact, just the opposite. The healthier you are, the harder you can push it, the more frequently you can push it, it's in your best interest to do things to keep you in one piece. So. Uh, I'm gonna go over a couple bracing cues that I do. So one is, we already talked about the neutral hips. When you deadlift, you don't wanna arch the, good God, there was a school of thought in powerlifting, 
I don't know if it's still around. I don't know if it's specifically Westside, but I remember coming across queues probably 15 years ago when, when multiply lifting was a lot more popular, where they would literally tell people to arch as hard as they could into the squat. And that is just such fucking bad advice. It's just on so many levels. It might, I mean, you, you get good at how you train, but that's just opening up the door for movement dysfunction. These are the same guys that put a thousand pounds on the back, they just crank their belt down, and they say just take a deep breath and push out. Well, that's the only way you can get tension because with that big arch, your abdominals are opened up. How are you supposed to handle any type of weight without that deep breath and belly push out against a belt? So it creates movement dysfunction because that's not how the abdominals are meant to move. It's not, they're not even stronger when they move that way. It's just a cheap ass substitute for pulling in, locking down, learning how to use them. Somebody who knows how to use their abdominals correctly is always gonna have a stronger midsection than someone who just takes a deep breath and shoves out against a belt. And that's why you get guys, Konstantino is a good example, right? Rest in peace. That dude could pull in the mid 900s. Uh, and he would have a, his own, he'd have slightly rounded upper back, but his midsection was just locked in. He looked like he could run a truck into his stomach and he'd be fine. And that's because the dude, it wasn't just that he had a thick waist. You could tell that those abdominals got used. You could tell he knew he knew how to lock them in and brace. And I, believe me, it was not just taking a deep breath and shoving your belly out. So correcting that, uh, not arching, because that exposes you, getting your spine neutral, because that's how it's built to support a load, and that's where the movers are stronger. So that was one, just getting comfortable standing here. When I first started, I was so tight through my hip flexors, because you're, as you tilt under, you're pulling your hip flexors up. So. If you're tight here, I mean, that short, that shortening in your hip flexors is part of what, you know, they're short right there, they're lengthened right there, and that stretches you through here. So I feel so tight through my quads. I feel this tension from contracting my glutes and hamstrings. So I'd be sweating just from trying to hold this. This is perfectly natural now. This is how I can just stand. And this is what I visualize as I'm about to get to the bar. So once you do that, you have to learn how to hinge in that position. Meaning, if I lock everything down, the second I go to break at the hip, I'm gonna to wanna to slide back into that position. So some of you might even have to get in front of a mirror. Get in front of a mirror, look right here. And you're gonna to have to, okay, lock it down, ribs down, I got that cannonball breathing, pulled in and locked in like I'm about to get punched in the stomach. And from right here, I'm maintaining that hip angle as I'm hinging. And it takes a while to get comfortable with it, to get good at it. But when you do it, that bar is gonna blow off the ground. Um, you also want to move incrementally up because that, again, is something that takes a long time to dial in and, and be very reliable. So you're not going to be doing math. You're not going to be setting 50 pound PRs the first time you do it right. Okay. You, you need to give yourself time to adapt to it, to integrate it. But once you get it, you get it right. Holy crap. It's just, it's game changer. So for the abdominals, and there's a lot of exercise you can do, but keeping in mind that the guy wires, right? Front to back, side to side, equal and opposite tension. They exist to limit movement. Uh, I read through some of Stuart McGill's stuff. He influenced a lot of what I do now. And uh, it's just surface level stuff. I mean, I'm not a spine specialist, but he had Brian Carroll as a, as a reference or as a testimony, and that was good enough for me. So I tried some of the things. They make sense, and holy crap, they work fantastically. So, you know, I guess I'm a fan, right? Um, but the main idea is that these muscles limit movement, okay? So I already did a deadlift video where I talked about the, the stabilizers, the supporters, basically everything above the waist. Everything below the waist is a mover. That's what actually moves the bar. So these muscles need to get comfortable moving. These muscles need to get comfortable bracing and resisting movement. And that's the key. That's when you know how to hinge. It's when these are locked in and they don't move. Most people, they go to move, they round and they extend. Once you can isolate those, you're on your path to being a good deadlifter. So for me, even if it's standing in front of a mirror, ribs down, okay, glutes tight lock them in and I'm breathing and you'll feel at the start how your inclination is to let them relax to get air in you need to keep them tight and force that air to as your diaphragm drops this is tight it forces air to redirect up into your lungs and you feel your rib cage open up so there's 90 90 breathing when you're on your back with your feet up on the wall and I'll feel it up in my neck because everything tries to strain and open up um, and general abdominal work is fine anything that gets the abdominals working is going to be good but bracing is always better. So planks are fantastic. Anti-rotation movements, anything where you're being twisted off to the side. So I'll give a couple of examples of those in just a minute. All right, so we're gonna start with 90-90 breathing. Uh, at first, it's a good exercise, it's actually pretty difficult, 
but it helps reinforce the patterning with your abdominals, how they brace appropriately while you breathe. Um, and doing it before a squat or deadlift session is a good way to kind of kick off those cues so that they're more easily accessible while you're lifting. And it takes a while, it's just practice. In the beginning, they're pretty hard. What you're gonna do is you're gonna lie with your hip and knee at 99 degrees, uh, sorry, 90 degrees with your feet up on the wall. You're gonna bring your ribs down, you're gonna pull your abdominals in and you're gonna tense them and you're gonna try to breathe into the brace dab. It's gonna go just like this. So hips and knees at 90 degrees, feet gripping the wall. I have my ribs down almost in a crunch position. Abdominals are in and tensed. And once they're tense, I'm gonna breathe in deeply for a five count. Now, as you exhale, you wanna exhale forcefully. You wanna squeeze your abdominals to try and push that air out, just like you would squeeze a tube of toothpaste. You wanna cycle through a few reps. At first, you might only get two or three, and then you'll feel your abs die. They'll just go dead. And that tells you that, that you have a problem with patterning. It's not just that they're so weak, which they might be, but it's that you have a problem recruiting them consistently. And that's a problem if you're squatting or deadlifting any amount of weight. So when you breathe in, remember your diaphragm drops into your stomach. Your stomach wants to rise. Well, you're limiting that. So that air gets redirected up into your lungs. I'll even feel it in my ribs, up in my neck. Uh, it's really uncomfortable. And then your abs start shaking and you realize how hard it is to keep them tense. So with this, we go for endurance. We go for more breaths, more repetition, a longer period of time while you're tensed and braced. And as that increases, you'll find your ability to brace during other movements is gonna increase. So the next thing, so the next thing we'll do is a dead bug. Many of you have probably seen this before, but this is where we start to complicate it so that we're adding other dynamic elements. Because remember, abdominals limit movement in your spine. So we need to learn how to move everything else while these stay locked down. So with the dead bug, now we're gonna same position, 90-90, but our feet aren't up on a wall, arms back. Okay, what we're gonna do, still tense, okay? Ribs down, abs tight. And you're going to, sorry, you're going to straighten your left leg and your right arm while maintaining this brace right here. And then you're gonna come back. And you wanna reinforce, don't just hold passively, squeeze as hard as you can while you move back into position. And this is where everyone screws up, you have to switch. Squeezing, maintaining tension the whole time. At first, again, it's more difficult than you would think it is. As you get better at it, you can do it longer and then you can get creative at tension. Uh, you can put a band behind you and, and pull with the band or attach a band to your foot to make it a little harder. And then that is what ultimately progresses into a bird dog. So now when you're flipped over like this, neutral position, the abdominals tight, you're doing the same thing. When you're on all fours, the abdominals have to work a lot harder. When you're on your back, you're already in a neutral position. You're nice and comfortable. On all fours, just like a plank position, you have to work to maintain that neutrality. So this is the progression we work in. So this is just to kick it off. This is just to, to build that base patterning and coordination and to get that endurance. And then once you do that, then you can start to attack more aggressive weighted variations and, uh, and start to improve yourself that way. So I'm gonna be putting out a lot more about bracing. This is probably the, the most under discussed topic in weightlifting that's actually relevant to everybody that nobody does as much as they should. And a lot of people, not just injuries, but they're probably being held back in what they could potentially do. So uh, if you got questions, leave them in the comment box. Until next time, this is Bromley from Empire Barbell. I'll see you.